I've spoken in my homilies before about consolations from God, some being more powerful than others, some whose effects will remain with us for weeks, months, and even years after we experience them. Well, the danger with consolations is that it can be tempting to want to remain in that experience or try to recreate it. We can become greedy for spiritual delights, or as St. John of the Cross said, we can become spiritual gluttons. And so God will take them away from us because we don't use them as we should and because he's trying to teach us that they're a means to an end and not the end itself. A Cistercian monk uh, by the name of Vitalis Lahoti, he once said, Let us seek God only, let us be attached to him only, and let us be aware of fixing our heart upon the consolations which help us on our way to him. A traveler doesn't attach his heart to the carriage or boat which is carrying him. Let us seek God only. Let us be attached to him only. This is something that the uh, people of Sodom and Gomorrah didn't do well. In our first reading, Abraham is speaking to God about their impending destruction. The people who lived there, they turned away from God. They lived wicked lives and they were obstinate in their sins. And now God was preparing to destroy them. Well, there's two themes that run through this reading. It's persistence and mercy. It's actually Abraham's persistence in questioning the Lord that reveals God's mercy. His initial question is, will you sweep away the innocent with the guilty? And we learn that if there, even if there were ten righteous people in the city, God would spare them. The sad thing, though, is that there weren't ten righteous people, and so in the end, the towns were destroyed. What's interesting about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, though, is it really highlights the destruction that awaits those who don't follow the Lord. The inhabitants, we could say, were happy from a worldly standpoint. They had everything they wanted, but they were wicked, and it's their wickedness that led to their destruction. On the other hand, Abraham's nephew Lot, who lived in Sodom at this time, um, he was considered righteous because he separated himself from the immorality of the people of Sodom. And uh, two angels, they appeared to him, and they told him to leave Sodom and go to a town called Zoar. And scripture says that the sun had risen on the earth when Lot arrived in Zoar which we could say is symbolic of Christ. He's the light of the world, and when we seek God by turning our face to him, we're filled with his light, and we turn our backs on the death and destruction of sin. Now, the fact that Sodom and Gomorrah was eventually destroyed, it doesn't mean that Abraham didn't try to save them. We saw him pleading with God on their behalf. And it doesn't mean that God didn't want to show them mercy. I'd say that it actually hurts God uh, more than us when we reject his mercy because he knows we need it and he's always ready to give it. He's really a father who's rich in mercy and he wants us to come to him for all our needs. And that's why Jesus, uh, uh, in our gospel today, he's instructing his disciples in prayer and he says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. I will say there are a few caveats with this. Um, I'm assuming most of y'all have seen the animated movie Aladdin. There's a few kids in here, so I'm sure they've probably seen it. And in there, Aladdin finds a lamp, and there's a genie in the lamp. And the genie uh, has to grant three wishes, and it can be whatever he wants. There's a few exceptions to that. Um, well, if we relate that to God, God isn't a genie. You don't get whatever you want from God. I could ask for a Lamborghini, and I'm sure God could give it to me. He could have one waiting in the parking lot for me after Mass. But most likely, he's not going to give me a Lamborghini. Because the prayer isn't genuine. It's coming from selfishness and greed. And God doesn't necessarily give us what we want, but he gives us what we need for salvation. And our prayer, it's really perfect when we ask God for what he wants us to ask for. That's why before telling his disciples to ask and you'll receive, Jesus instructs them uh, in the Our Father. 
And we know that part of the Our Father is God's will be done or thy will be done. Because the truth is we don't really know what we need. We don't know what to ask for. The very thing we ask for or think we need, like consolations or delight in prayer, that could be the very thing that causes us to fall into sin. And so a better way to pray is really to follow the example of our Lord and say, Thy will be done. The goal for prayer is for us to change, for us to grow in virtue and become better, and to fulfill our duties to God and neighbor. In short, prayer helps us become saints. Through it, we learn God's will for us and how to surrender to that will so that we can move away from the darkness and destruction of sin like Lot and turn to the light of Christ. And when we surrender ourselves to God's will, we discover, as Paul said in our second reading, that at baptism we were buried with Christ. We put to to death our old ways of life so that we could be raised to new life with him. Now, if you remember anything from this homily, um, just remember this, that our God is a God of mercy. He's not a God of destruction. The life of Jesus teaches us this. The cross of Christ reminds us of this. And so seek God only. Uh, Be attached to him only through our persistence in prayer and through living according to his will.